will answer you. God is committed to you. He said his eye is going to and fro the earth on behalf of his children so that he can show himself faithful and mighty on their behalf. He said he is not called here me to seek him in vain. He is a rewarder of them who diligently and faithfully seek him. God rewards faithfulness. And do not be deceived by the lies of the enemy. God delights in the prosperity of his people. Nothing gives the Father more joy than to see you living the life that he has called you to live to the full potential. He says in the book of John chapter 10 verse 10 that you and I know. He said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come. And so God is not your enemy. God is not the one that is after your home. God is not the one after your marriage. God is not teaching you any lesson by punishing you. God is not a sadist. Amen. You must know that. You must know that God is not, God does not delight in your pain. No, the Bible says, I've not seen it where the Bible says God delights in my pain. Or God take pleasure in my suffering. No, the Bible says he delights in the prosperity of his people. And he says it is the Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. And the kingdom of God, the Bible says, is righteousness, is joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. He say it is nothing gives the Father more pleasure. He say, oh, you little one. When he sees you, he sees his little child that needs divine attention. God has not abandoned you. God has not forsaken you. God will not forget you. Amen. Amen. So just be encouraged this morning on this great day, this Pentecost Sunday. And as we see the, the power of God, I just want you to just believe that the prayer of faith this morning has touched you. Galatians chapter 5 from verse 16. I read quickly. This I say then. Work in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the order. So that ye cannot do things that you would. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are this. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, hearsays, envying, murders, and drunkenness, and rivalry, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do the things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. I'm, I'm going to stop there at the first part of 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit and we, we, we continue, like I said to us uh, in the last couple of weeks, and looking at the benefit of the Holy Spirit and the, and, and the, 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 the necessity of how it's important for you and me. Uh, you say, when you are led by the Spirit, you know, you are the sons of God. You say, walk in the Spirit. You know, you say, I say to you, walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Living in the Spirit is the... Uh, way to go and that is the the path to victory that is the path into wholesomeness as a child of god Great, conversion is good and uh, 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 but the, the 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 end result should be my desire to be filled with the holy ghost and filled with the holy spirit and we are looking i just feel that not to take and not to rush it wherever the lord helps us to stop we'll stop there and continue because it's important for you and me to get this foundation in relation to our work and our growth in the Lord. And the first three that we started with, which is love, joy, and peace. You know, and this is in relation to me. And like I said, it was on Sunday, last Sunday, until the platform, the platform for every good Christian work and victory is love. Until that is established, I cannot build anything that will remain solid and faithful. And so the first three fruit was dealing and still deals with me it's in relation to me. And until I get it right with me, before I can get it right with you. And so the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
And God, as I understand more and more in my own little way, and I don't know it all, but the little I'm getting to know about God and in relation to us is that indeed God is so just and God is so simple but yet complicated. You and I try to complicate the scripture, complicate it through theology and big words and Greek and Latin translation. But the gospel is very, very simple because the gospel was first handed to illiterate men and women, people who were not educated, people who were not enlightened. And most of the people, except for the few that wrote the text that you and I are reading today, were not really learned men, apart from somebody like Paul the Apostle, who was a, 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 a scholar or a lawyer, a student of law, and somebody like Dr. Luke. But by then you begin to look at people like John and Peter, they were not educated, they were not enlightened, but if they could understand Jesus and relate to him, that is to say the gospel came to a point where it was so simple that even a child could relate to it, and so why are we getting so complicated and confused with theology today, and that is why I believe that so many confusion is going on, and it's in my heart to begin to try to understand God from a, a, a child-like point of view, because Jesus said for you to be able to see the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God you must receive the gospel like a child that is to say I must be able to explain the gospel you know in a simple language that a child can can comprehend relate to it and accept it amen do you understand what I'm saying this morning and so I'm going somewhere this morning so we're gonna keep looking at that we're gonna look at one other fruit this morning because the first three fruit, like I said, deal with me in relation to me. Love, joy, and peace. Because until that is settled, I cannot really have a complete relationship with God. Because until, and, 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 and understanding that made me to understand something that God, God is not in a hurry. In, 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 the, in the table of our work with God, I'm talking about W-A-L-K. Uh, our work with God, the progression goes in this way. First, because I've, I'm in a hurry to get to know God, which is wonderful. I'm in a hurry to have a spiritual experience and begin to walk in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Heal the sick and prophesy and raise the dead. This is beautiful. That is part of it. That is part of the gift. That God is not in a hurry to impact the gift into me. God is more interested in me bearing fruit. Because the fruit is greater than the gift. The fruit lasts through all eternity. The gift is for here and now. Alone. And so until, and so God starts the progression of my work with God, starts to first getting me fixed. And if God gets me fixed, then God then, the second stage is to getting me fixed with my neighbor. Right? I get it right with me, then I get it right with you, before I can start getting it right with him. But I want to bypass those two processes. Right? I can hate you. I don't need to talk to you. All I need is God. How many times have I heard people say that? All I need is God. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. You can't get me because you're jumping the rope. You must get you first. And when you don't get in you, then get your neighbor first, second. And when you don't get in your neighbor, then you can get me. Right? <laughs> that is how simple it is and how complicated it can be too. And, and so when the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and they are all singular, it's not plural, it's all one, it's just like you take an apple fruit. It's one fruit, but it's made of many layers, but they are all one embodied. You, you take an orange, it's a fruit, but in that fruit there is a seed, and there is the chaff, there is the cover, it's all one. You can't separate one from the other. You need the whole thing to be one full orange fruit. And the Bible said you need the whole fruit working to be able to work in the spirit. But this morning we're going to look at the fruit called joy. 
Joy that has nothing to do with money. Joy that is not happiness. Happiness is temporal. Happiness is informed by situation and circumstances. But joy is, comes from within. So Jesus speaking to the woman by the well in John chapter 4, and when she said, give me this water so that I don't have to come, keep coming back to church and, and just going to crusade and going from one concert, from one convention to the other and just going from one seminar to the other trying to fix my marriage and trying to fix my life. He said, give me this water so that I don't have to keep coming because every time I come back, I come back dry and more testy than I was yesterday. And Jesus said, you know, God is looking for those who will worship him in truth and in spirit. He said, a time is coming, and now is that time, that God will no longer be sought for in the mountain. But God is looking for men who will worship him in spirit and in truth. He said, those are the kind of worshipers that God is seeking. And, she, and the woman became very interested in that discourse. And she, Jesus said, I have water. But in John chapter 4 verse 10, you heard Jesus said, if only you know the gift of God. Because it's a gift. He said, if you knew the gift of God, and who is he that is speaking to you, you would have asked him, and he would have given you this living water. If you know the gift of God. And this is what it is. And Jesus said, when I give you this water, you say, out of that person, will begin to well the wells of living water. Something will begin. So that means there is something inside of you here that everybody seated before God this morning had the capacity within him or herself to bet that spirit. Because it's an act of him will flow so that flow, something needs to activate it. There had to be a contact with something greater than yourself. Something that has nothing to do with the physical element around us. Jesus said, I, when that person gets in contact with me, out of him will begin to flow. He didn't say, it's going to come from somewhere else. So inside of you, when God breathed into you and to me, Everything was deposited inside. It just waited for the right time for it to pop out. And like the songwriter said, this joy I have. He said, the world didn't give it to me. The world can't take it away from me. Now, a man who has contracted and contacted that spirit of joy, nothing around you, you may be crying, all hell may be breaking loose in and around you. You keep on keeping on. Now, that spirit of joy takes away sorrow. You can be sad. You can be angry. You can be disappointed. But you cannot be sorrowful. Because the rivers of joy that have been activated via the agent called the Holy Ghost is so powerful that nothing external can assess it. It's inside of you. You don't know where it is. You can't touch it. In Psalm 51 verse 10 to 12, David began to cry and was crying out. He said, create to me a pure heart or a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Take not that Holy Spirit away from me. And then in verse 12, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Because the joy of salvation becomes a necessity after my conversion. That has me to renew my spirit.
And this morning, like joy, somebody, they define joy as what? Jesus first, others, and then you at the bottom of the ladder. Because having that connection, when I begin to look to God for my sustenance and not to any other thing is Tana, then I'm in the process of becoming a joyful person. Because joy becomes, like I said, joy is given, not receiving. And joy is a gift of the Holy Ghost. And there is no other way this morning than the story in the book of John chapter 6 that better demonstrate Jesus, others, and you. And to understand how joy can become effective and contagious in this last day that you and I need to begin to bear that fruit in such a way that the world around you and me, because there's something about a fruit. The fruit is attractive. Fruit, people, everybody wants to eat of fruit. Right? When you are sick, the doctor will say, get some fruits. Amen. Fruits are sweet. Apple fruit and oranges. We want fruit. And Jesus said, I have chosen you to do what? That you might what? Bear fruits. Not have gifts. It is that I have chosen you for you to become a miracle worker, a prophet and prophet. As wonderful as those gifts are, God is more concerned about me as a child of the kingdom bearing fruit because there is nothing more attractive than the right fruit. Gifts are for show most of the time. Right? I, I, I say this and, and I, was, I was talking with us that we were discussing the other day, we were watching uh, the news. And uh, this lady came up. I think it was the queen, whether it was the queen of England before them or the chancellor of, uh, of Germany. And I just said to Esther, and I said, what makes these women, these two women, so powerful? I said, it's not their position. It's not their age. It is not their money. I said, it is something about them. It is their strength of moral character that is attractive. The Queen of England, you can say anything you want about her. Like Jesus said, the prince of this world come and find nothing against me. There are people, because it's not so much, and we have heard of men, even in the kingdom today. People like Billy Graham. I don't know, I've not read anywhere in his story or biography. I've learned I follow him a lot, and one of the men I admire in this time and age of my life, I just love that man. If there's anything I covet, is the grace that worked in the life of that man. But I have not read anywhere where Billy Graham opened a blind man's eyes. I know, I don't know if anybody has heard a story that he prayed in his crusade, a blind man eyes open or, you know, through his career, somebody d dead came back to life. You know what I mean? I've not read anywhere where it happened. But I've read about other men and women of God that those supernatural power gift worked in their ministry and we cannot doubt it. We know it happened. But yet when we hear their name we wink. <laughs> right? You're just like, whatever. But not Billy Graham. Because one thing that worked and is still working in his life was the fruit. And so that fruit is contagious. So both believers and unbelievers are attracted to fruit. They are not attracted to gifts. Because even the devil, the Bible says, can do miracles. Amen. And so, in all your getting, get the fruit. John chapter 6. I want to go quickly to something here. Can we open to John chapter 6 from verse 1 to 7? 
I'm going to wrap this up. John chapter 6. I want you to, to follow me carefully on this as we. Okay. From verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracle, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that this may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he knew himself, he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that everyone may take a bite. One of the, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? As I, relate to this. Jesus, this, the reason why Jesus functioned in his capacity, in his God-given assignment here effortlessly was one thing, the spirit of joy. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 45, it said, because you loved righteousness, and hated iniquity. The Lord your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And so the grace to enjoy life comes through the anointing of joy. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, the, the writer of Hebrew began to quote that scripture. He said, Thou loveth righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Because the fuel of joy, the, 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 the spirit of joy was what gave Jesus the grace to function here in every God-given assignment without complaining, without losing heart. It was the spirit of joy that empowered him to give of himself. Because before he stepped onto the planet earth here, he came with that spirit of joy. The Lord God anointed him above his fellows. And so in the Bible says, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, he said, for the joy set before him, he was able to endure. Because the reason why I understood why Jesus was so compassionate, because it is the spirit of joy that fuels the grace to be compassionate. I'll say that again. It is the spirit of joy that gives you and me the grace to be compassionate to people in crisis. Matthew chapter 14 verse 14 said, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. And when he saw them, what happened? He had compassion. Joy is what enables me to be compassionate because that is where the Bible, they, 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 they say, Jesus, others, and you. Because joy fuels the spirit of compassion in us. Joy also helps you and me to go through the challenges of life with confidence, hope, and assurance. The spirit of joy helps you and me to go through the challenges of life, the challenges of your everyday life <coughs> with confidence, hope, and assurance. Hebrew 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, it is joy that helps you deal with the stress and the crisis of life. It is the spirit of joy that gives you the grace to endure. No happiness. Because a man or a woman who has joy welling up in them, they can't be crying. They're still going. Everything may be on fire. They are still going. 
And this is what makes life of a child, a true child of God, filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, attractive to the world. And I use this illustration all the time in the book of Exodus when Moses saw the burning bush. That's what we call it, but that is wrong. Nobody stops to look at a burning bush. No matter how drugged you are. Amen. No matter how crazy upstairs you are. If you see a bush burning, if you stop and start looking at a bush burning, that means you are really sick and there is no hope in you anymore. Amen. Uh, you know what I mean? Because bush are meant to burn. When you set the bush on fire, it's supposed to burn. That is the natural thing to do. But what happened to the bush was, the bush was on fire, but it refused to burn. Amen. You see the difference? The bush was not burning. The bush was on fire, but it refused to burn. It was, there was flame all over that bush, but it just would not burn. So Moses had to stop and say, what is it about this bush from every other bush that we have set on fire before? How come that this bush is on fire and it just will not burn? And that is the story of a man or a woman that is filled with the Holy Ghost. When the enemy can look through your life and see that here is your marriage on fire. Just now your husband just does something so horrible. And yet you're still lifting up holy hands. And they can peep through the window and can still see you genuinely praising God and say, Ain't nobody can do me like Jesus. You just lost your job. And you are still praising and rejoicing in the God of your salvation. You have been set on fire and they are waiting for you to burn. And you just refuse to burn. The fruit of joy is showing. Suddenly, like Moses People are going to say, what is it about you? How come this fire that is consuming everybody around was not touching you? Because the joy. There is tears in your eyes. You are crying, but you just won't give up. You just won't quit. That is what joy does. That is why the fruit of joy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit called joy, is a necessity in this last day. And this is one thing. You know, like I always say, tears. If you take the S away from T-E-R, it means to shred, to tear to pieces. What tears does to you is that it blinds your focus. It blinds you from seeing. And what the spirit of joy does is that the joy, the spirit of joy helps you to see solution in the midst of your problem. Amen. Joy gives you direction in the midst of the crisis. Now, in John, where we read the story, everybody was hungry. Jesus, right? Because he's got the spirit of joy in him. There was a problem of hunger and food. Jesus did not say, where can we get money from to feed these people? Read the story. Jesus said, where will we find bread to feed these people? Jesus, the spirit of joy was looking at something else. Jesus did not ask about, did not amplify the problem because the spirit of joy was at work in Jesus. Jesus was able to identify solution and not a problem. Jesus said, where can we find bread? And so Jesus also, in the midst of the crisis, Jesus was first able to identify their need. Jesus saw these people who have need for food. And when he saw their need, he was able to also, through the spirit of joy, see the solution. What joy does also is this. Joy helps you. To be sensitive to the need of others, even while you are still suffering. I'll take that again. The spirit of joy helps you and me to be sensitive to the need of other people around you, even when you are still suffering. Jesus was able to identify their need. Jesus was still concerned about feeding these people. If I was Jesus, I've already done the power thing. I have healed them. 
performed so many miracles? What's my business if they are hungry? They should be now praising me and thanking me that Jesus was still sensitive to their need in the midst of needs. That is what the spirit of joy does to you. Jesus also asks this question. He says, where do we get bread and not money? Now, what I, I, when I read that, the Holy Spirit said something to me. That in every situation, the desire to meet needs must precede the means with which to get it. First of all, what I mean by that is that I must first of all desire to meet the need first. I shouldn't worry how the need is going to be met. There's something in me, the joy, what joy does in me is that as soon as I see a problem, something inside of me wants to solve it. Before I start thinking of how do I solve this problem? Where do we get the solution? Jesus was more concerned about meeting the need than how to meet the need. But the reverse is the case. When the spirit of joy is not working fully in me, because I'm thinking more of myself. Like Philip. Philip, who has not yet contracted that spirit, was more concerned about his situation. Philip said to Jesus, he said, 200 penny worth of bread we'll not be able to feed these guys, even if we have it. One, the school of thought will have it say this, that Philip mentioned that amount because that was all they had. And so in retrospect, they were saying, if we give all Jesus, we have healed these people, we have been kind to them, and now you want us to give everything, what about us? Even if we use the $200 that we have now to buy bread, it's not going to go. It's not going to be enough. And then we'll be stranded. We'll have no money. Our future, what is going to happen to us? Fear. Philip was responding out of fear. But Jesus was responding through the spirit of faith. He was seeing something that they could not see. Fear of not having enough should not stop us from giving to the needs of others. That was what the story is telling me. And this is the only way joy can help you accomplish that. Because like the man said, he that can make one person, that if Philip had known the scripture that says in the book of Psalms, that he makes one would chase a thousand. Right? Is that not what the Bible says? One would chase a thousand. It takes the Holy Ghost power for one person to put one thousand people to fly. That same God is able to make one low feed one thousand. Understanding. Jesus was teaching and demonstrating what joy can help you accomplish. Joy frees you from the stress and the worry of tomorrow. Joy frees you from fear and insecurity about your future. Philip was worried about your future. Jesus was concerned about the need that was present right now that needed divine attention. And Jesus said, you know the story, and Jesus said, make the people to sit down. And wanting that Jesus, and this is what the spirit of joy does to you. And realize that reading that text again, that every time a man who is helping out of joy still dignifies the helpee. Is that a word? <laughs> the one you are helping. The helper and the helpee. <laughs> the one who is helped and the one who has been helped. Now, you know, sometimes it's easy for me to look at a person I'm helping as a burden or a liability. Right? Amen. We do that unconsciously sometimes. We look at the people we are helping as a liability. And we just want to treat them like trash. We want to give them anything that's good enough for him. He's a beggar. And we have a saying that a beggar has no choice. Amen. 
But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, even though these people were in need, and he was the one in position to meet their need, he still treated them with dignity and respect. So he said, make them sit down on a green grass. Give them undivided attention. Joy makes you do that. Come, joy makes you put other people ahead of you. And the bigger part of the story is the lad. And a few years ago, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to the story. I was at a funeral. And they were talking about this man. And some of us know him. And suddenly, the last one of the men, I don't know whether it was the son or a friend that came up on that funeral day that day in Edmonton. And I came leaving that funeral crying. I was sitting down behind there. I was weeping because as soon as I heard that testimony about this man, and the man said he was talking to this man one day, and the man in turn, the man who died that we had the funeral said, so the man said to him that he is, the Lord told him very early in his life that he is the lad in John chapter 6. And as soon as they said that, you know, it was like a veil just opened. One of the few times in my life, I will say the second time, one the first time I really, when I was stepping out to go into the ministry, when I told that story, I shared that story time and time again. When they were asking and said, is anybody here who felt the call of God upon their life to go into the uh, to go into ministry, to stand up? And when I was about standing up, a lady who I later found out was a pastor heard my pants and pulled me down. And they said, that call is not for people like you. Can you imagine in a church? She did it twice. They were saying, oh, God is calling some of you here into full-time ministry. If you are one of such stand up, people were standing up. I was going to stand up. And this lady held me down. Maybe because the way I was dressed, I don't know. And they said, that call is not for people like you. And I said, sorry. <laughs> and I sat down. Because I wasn't church friendly. I didn't know the protocol of Christianity that well. So when I thought I was doing something wrong. But suddenly, the Lord just opened my eyes. And I saw myself. As a nine or ten years old boy, praying and crying to God because of the, the bullying and the humiliation in school. You know, Tada, when, or Tada, Dave, and Melody, and Sheridan have been there. And I was going to that school down the road there in the other second village. And I remember I, 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 as a ten years old boy or so, I couldn't read nor write. And my dad brought me from the barracks, from the city to go stay with my late grandmom, and they took me to the school. I was big for nothing then. I was so dull in my brain, I could neither, I, I mean, and they were laughing and mocking at me. And I remember to cut a long story short, and the teacher said, tomorrow you're coming to read. I don't know how that story ended. The Holy Spirit had blocked that part. But I remember coming home that night, kneeling down on my late grandmom's metal bed that was this high, like... <laughs> And that's like a two-story building bed. I don't know how to make those those days. You have to, you need a ladder to climb on. <laughs> and I was on that, kneeling down there, and I was crying to God. I said, God, teach me how to read and write. A desperate cry of a young man, a child. Teach me how to read and write, and I will use it to work for you. I didn't know why I prayed that prayer. I didn't know who put that. I forgot all about that. And suddenly that evening, while this woman was trying to pull me down the third time or the second time, that just came. And I screamed. And she thought I was screaming at her. Then she left me. But I was screaming, fighting. And I said, God, no. No, no, no. I was just a child. I realized that moment, that very moment that I was signing in for something bigger than myself. That was the beginning of my faith work. And this other day again, a few years ago in Edmonton, two or three years ago, I can't remember now. While I was sitting at that funeral, and when they mentioned that story and said, this man said, God told him he was the lad in John chapter 6. And suddenly my eyes opened and I saw something that I never saw before in that story. 
And the Holy Spirit said, there's something about that young child that a lot of us have missed. That that boy was not asked to bring his bread. That boy, nobody asked him. He overheard Jesus having a conversation with his disciples about the need. And something inside of him, forgetting about himself, forgetting that this was the lunch that mama has packed for you. He forgot that he too was part of the problem. Suddenly something inside of him just sprang out. And he went and offered everything that is God. Forgetting about his need. Young boy, don't you know you're going to be hungry? Don't you know this is your lunch? You don't know the distance between here and home. And when he brought it, that's why Andrew said, here is a lad here offering us five love. How can you disrespect something that is done out of joy? Common, making it so common. This boy gave out of his need to Jesus. He saw Jesus needing something. Nobody asked him. And he just said, I have five loaves here. Childishly. That's why Jesus said, for you to go to the kingdom or to see the king, you must think like a child. Innocently say, I have five loaves and two fishes. You can give it to them. And the heart of heaven broke. Jesus did not reject it. Because Jesus knew that this lad came in contact with something that he was trying to make the disciples get. The disciples that saw him walk on water. The disciples that saw him raise the dead. The disciples that saw him open the blind eyes had no faith in him. Because it's not a power gift that makes all the difference. It is the fruit. Only a lad was willing to identify with a hope that he could not see. And he said, here, I have give this to these people. Heaven broke down. It wasn't the gift. It is the heart. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, it says, if there be first a willing heart. Joy is what makes me willing to consider your need. Joy is what makes me willing to trek an extra mile to make your life comfortable. Joy is what makes me forget about myself because you are involved. The Bible says, if there be first a willing heart, it is acceptable unto God. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 12. You see, if that be a willing heart, that boy was willing to give everything. And from that little, 5,000 men were fed. Joy broke open the gates of heaven because one child was willing. And I remember this, that sitting down that funeral, I came to the hotel crying, telling Esther, I said, my life, I can't bear the same. And I keep praying, I said, God, let me see what that man saw. Let me see what he saw. Let me see what that lad sees in the kingdom. Let me bear the fruit of joy that's willing to step one step further. I was having a conversation with, uh, with my friend, uh, the Pastor Phil, that is coming. He, he lost his dad, I think on Friday. His father went to be with the Lord and he called me. And he said, John, don't worry. The work of the kingdom must go on. He said, even when the father was in coma, was sick, we had a talk and I was praying with him. And he said, he told his dad, the dad is giving him his blessing and he's going. He said, even if it means then keeping the father on life support or putting him in a morgue, what he has signed for the kingdom, he's going to go such passion comes from joy and we were talking and, and I was getting discouraged for him and my heart was bleeding for him and he turned around and said John can't you remember you told me that there are about 5,000 people in Grand Cash 
And I said, yeah, I have made no sense of it. And then he brought me back again to the story. Friday again. And he said, do you remember how God gave, a little lad gave his everything to God. And out of that little, he was able to break it and feed over 5,000 people. And he said, I see God coming to do the same in Grand Cash. He said, whatever sacrifice that is going on, he said, if nothing, because he sees the heaven repeating what happened that day in the scripture. So my heart just could not contain it. And only that is possible through the spirit of joy. I don't know about you this morning. I don't know how heavy your heart is. As I listen to that man's testimony, living to be 92, I remember going to see him at the age of 92. And it snowed. And he had shoveled, his, two, his driveway was two, two big car garage. A 92 years old man shoveled about how many inches of snow. I came and I said, did somebody come to do it? He said, no, I need to do that to be strong. And I look at myself and I told him, I said, what? You did this yourself? He said, yes. God did something. And I remember going to him. And the Lord said, go to him. I took some meat to him, like Jacob did to Esau. And I came to him and I said, he wanted to give me money for gas after I bring him the meat. And the Holy Spirit said, no. And I remember telling Pastor Cliff, you know, wonderful man, Pastor Cliff. <laughs> I love him. He's a good man, good heart. And we were talking about it and I said, this is what God said I should do. And he said, wow. I'm going to do the same. <laughs> but we did the same. But I remember going to this old man. And I never realized it until later that he was also of a Jewish descent. And I, when I gave him the, the, what I brought to him, and he was going to give me a check that day, I said, no. I don't want money. And he looked at me and said, why? I said, I want you to bless me. And he just stood back. Because he realized the magnitude of what I was asking. And before he could say anything, I just knelt down in front of him. And I said, Lord, I want everything and more that you've given unto this man. I want to walk in that revelation. I want to walk in the joy that will be able to put others first. I want to experience the, you know, like David said, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Listen to me, child of God. The Holy Spirit, this day of Pentecost, you can. Because in the heart of God, the Bible says it gives God pleasure. Whatever you are stressing about, the fear of your future, giving of yourself is not money alone. We are so poor that every time we hear give, we think about money. Poverty is not what you have. Poverty is who you are. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Poverty has nothing to do with the vehicle you drive, or where you live, or the dress you wear, or how fat or thin your bank account is. Poverty has to do with who you are. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, it said you think you are rich, but yet you are poor. Poverty brings fear. That lad, through the spirit of joy, broke that open. And you know the story. There was abundance and leftover. This morning, there is a spirit of Pentecost. When the Holy Ghost came upon them in the upper room, the Bible said they just began to rejoice. And they began to speak in other tongues. Began to glorify God. They went beyond themselves. Those who were shy began to share the goodness of the kingdom. Sharing the word of God. If the truth of the gospel, if it is real to you, you will share it with your neighbor. You will share it with your children. That is given. That is given. That is given. Don't think of giving about when they say give, it's not money. 
The Lord said, if I am hungry, I will not ask you. That's what God said. He said, the cattle on the thousand hills are mine. Don't let money take away your joy. Shall we stand up this morning? That grace twice in my life I can say I have seen the Lord. And what drives people is that light. When suddenly your eyes are open and that unstoppable joy. You may not have what they have. You may not drive what the other one drives. You may not live where they live. But something inside of you scores to make you an unenviable person. Haven't you seen people who are richer than you, jealous of you? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> they are not happy with you and you kind of wonder why. You know, because they have come to realize that it's not about what they have. Because it's not about what you are, it's about who you are inside. Jesus said a man's life does not consist of the abundance of what he has. And it is in that light and I, once in a while I say, God, maybe I prayed wrongly. As a young Christian, when I caught that, for me, I used to pray. I said, Lord, I don't want to raise the dead. But I want you to give me a word from you. That even a dead man in a casket, when he hears it from the throne of grace through me, he will be happy to die. Because it is the power of God's word. That changes a man's destiny. That young lad heard Jesus. He didn't see Jesus perform any miracle before then. He just heard this man said, where can we get bread? Because Jesus didn't ask for money. He asked for bread. You see the revelation there? Jesus said, where can we get bread to feed these people? And the boy said, ah, you don't have to go far. Little child, he said, there is bread here. You're looking for bread. I have bread. God is not looking for your money. He's looking for your heart. And we must get that into our head to receive joy. God is not interested in what you have. He's interested in who you become. So we must rid ourselves of that thing that is robbing us of peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. God is not interested in what you have or what you don't have. Every time God approaches a man, he's trying to get to your heart. And this morning God is saying, like that woman by the well, I have something to give you that will bring you joy unspeakable. Joy that will make you put Jesus first, orders, and you at the bottom of the list. And the thing is that when you put yourself last, it doesn't mean you are last. Jesus said, those who are last will become what? The first. Heaven arithmetic, is, you can't understand it. That boy, I believe that those 12 baskets, Jesus was okay, young man, how many can you carry home? <laughs> Amen. He came with five loaves and two fishes. I mean, Maybe he went with some, maybe Jesus would have told Philip and Andrew, those ones that were doubting, carry this thing and follow this boy home, just to teach you a lesson. Because that guy can carry that basket. There is a basket of blessing waiting for you. But all you need to do is just open your heart first to the Lord. First give of yourself. Deal with your heart condition. It's a heart condition. We don't have a money problem. We have a heart problem in this society. And that heart is robbing you and me of our God-given joy. I just want you to just talk to God this morning. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes. Me sitting at that funeral, they didn't say much. All I heard was that they said, this man said he's that lad in the book of John. 
That was all I had. The rest was downloaded directly via the Holy Ghost. It wasn't the preaching that got to me. It was the Holy Spirit that began to speak to me. Because God stationed me there, planted me there to hear something, to run with it. And I've been running with that thing. And it's my prayer this morning that somebody will contract that Holy Ghost revelation that will change everything in your life, in your family. Let the fruit of joy that is part of the gift of God be deposited into your family this morning, into your situation in the name of Jesus. May the Spirit of God release life into you. Father God, even as we go today, when you resurrected, the Bible said you kept talking to those disciples and they did not recognize you. But when you took the bread and you broke it and you gave it to them, their eyes were opened. Lord, as many, whoever wants to take this communion today, I pray, Father God, may the eyes of their understanding be enlightened. That everything I have said back and forth may not make sense, but may one word alone begin to amplify what they need from today's word that will change the course of their destiny and that of their family for good in the name of Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the glory of God that brings joy unspeakable rest upon you and your family like never before. May that which you are seeking find you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.